Uh, people okay to get started? Yeah. All right. So just to reset it for the millions of people who will be watching from around the world, uh, my name is Evan George. Thank you again for having me here. So I'm here with the Massachusetts Office on Disability along with the Department of Homeland Security to talk about emergency preparedness. Quick show of hands, did everyone here hear about the wildfires out in California? Yeah. So the most recent ones during that event, the electrical company shut off the power to hopefully slow down the fires. Unfortunately, what they didn't do was tell people that they were going to do this ahead of time. So what ended up happening was senior citizens, people with disabilities, people who live in assisted living or independent living, their power went out and they had to really self-sustain by themselves for two or three days. And as a result, some people died because they did not have the same services that they're used to. And that is exactly the type of scenario that I'm here to talk about. When the unpredictable happens, will we be able to be self-sufficient for a three-day period? And this whole training comes out of Hurricane Katrina. So the first uh, trivia question of the day. What year was Hurricane Katrina? It's funny because I can hear somebody saying they were just in New Orleans. <laughs> but um, so the correct answer is 2005. So in 2005, Hurricane Katrina completely devastated the city of New Orleans and resulted in about 1,800 deaths. What they then did is something called an after action report. And what they found was that half the people who died, so now roughly 900 people, fell into two different categories, either senior citizens or people with disabilities, which we refer to as people who require additional assistance. And at first, this confused everyone. People didn't understand why was the death count so high for these two populations. So what they did was they looked through New Orleans' emergency plan, and what they found was that really at no times did they take into account the very unique needs that senior citizens or people with disabilities would have. So for example, if we send out a communication blast telling you to evacuate, but if you're deaf or hard of hearing, how do you actually get that alert? Or if we tell you to evacuate to a shelter and that shelter is 20 miles away and you don't drive or you have issues with mobility, how do you actually get from where you are to the shelter? Mm. Believe it or not, before 2005, a lot of these questions weren't thought through. So what I get to do is I travel around to every city and town in Massachusetts that I can and put on as many of these micro trainings so not just so you're all individually prepared, also that you'll know what to expect in the results of emergency, but also so you can now share this information. Because even though this training is only about another 50 minutes, you will be the most knowledgeable and prepared people in your community. It doesn't matter how many PhDs somebody has or their life experience, no one is really prepared for if the phone goes off saying you must evacuate. So trivia question number two. How many cities and towns are there in Massachusetts? Ooh, very close, uh, 351. And as part of these trainings, I've been on the job for just over a year now. I've been to 60 different cities and towns, so I still have about another 300 to go. And every city and town has two things in common. You have a local emergency manager, and you have a local emergency plan. For $500, who here has seen your local emergency plan? I'm just imagining someone's watching this on TV raising their hand, but they don't, they don't count for this. So the reason I can make that little wager with you is because we don't make it publicly available. That's how I know you haven't seen it. And at first that might seem a little counterintuitive, like you would imagine I have your plan right now and we're going to discuss it. But similar to what was mentioned earlier, one of the reasons we don't make it publicly available is we really don't know what the disaster is going to look like. So I think it was mentioned that right now on your local emergency plan, your primary shelter is the local high school. However, three years from now, if there is some big event, you're going to remember that. And you're going to think to yourself, oh yeah, I was at that training with that nice bald man and he told us to go to the high school. However, if that event happens to be a tornado and that tornado is heading right to that high school, well now guess what? That isn't your shelter. So I don't want you to think when you leave this training, just head to the high school and I'll be okay. What you have to be able to do is adapt in the moment, which is why the biggest section that I focus on is just communication. 
how will you all figure out what's going on and what are some little tips and tricks you can use. So with that, we can turn to these nice packets. So this um, course, we'll call it, is a little bit of a lecture, which means I get to kind of just stand up here and talk a lot, which I love. I can talk for hours on almost any subject. But what that also means is that if you don't want to flip through this, if you'd rather kind of just sit back, relax, have your coffee and your sandwich, you don't need to follow along with them. Or vice versa, if you're already kind of sick and tired of looking at me, if you just read everything in here, this will cover the entire uh, training. So we have the nice shiny blue packet that looks like I made a mistake printing, but I'll explain that later. You can kind of just put that one down. In the middle, we have two white packets. And the one that I'm going to go over first says go right on the uh, cover. But again, if it's going to be too taxing to flip back and forth, you don't have to worry about it. So the first page is your table of contents, and then pages two and three are about the Massachusetts Office on Disability. Very quickly, quick show of hands, who here has ever heard of the Massachusetts Office on Disability? OK, good. We have some experts. So very quickly, the Office on Disability was founded in the early 1980s, and it's their job to ensure the full and equal participation of people with disabilities in everyday life. What that means, and what it means to have a disability, means that you just need additional assistance with one of life's major tasks. So whether that's seeing, listening, walking around, lifting, bathing, using the restroom, if you need assistance with anything like that, then this office is really here to help you and to provide you with information and services. Their inf contact information is listed six or seven different times throughout the training, but it's on the front page right there. So if you ever have questions or concerns or feel like your rights are being violated as somebody who might identify as having a disability, this is the phone number you call to help you navigate that complex web that is the bureaucracy. So if you have questions like, at my uh, living facility, we don't have enough handicap parking. Or why don't we have one of the buttons to open up this door? Or if you feel you're being discriminated against at like your job, workplace, or restaurant. These are the people that are there to help you out, along with what I'm doing right now, which is to provide you with trainings. The next page is about 911, and I'll get to that in like a second. But the first thing that I really want to highlight is on page five, and it's called the 911 Disability Indicator Form. So I briefly alluded that something we learned after Hurricane Katrina was we really don't have a good system of knowing who needs help, of knowing who needs assistance. So what this form does is it allows you to voluntarily disclose information about yourself. You would bring this to your local police station, and then they would put this information in 911. So if you ever needed to call 911, operator picks up, hello, 911, what is your emergency? Well, if you filled out this form, and let's say you marked you were deaf or hard of hearing, that'll now display on the monitor screen. So now when the dispatcher sees that and they contact your local police, they can say, oh, you're responding to someone who's deaf or hard of hearing. You can't just knock on the door. You have to do X, Y, or Z. But there is no way your local police would know that unless you voluntarily disclosed it. Because we may have accepted at maybe high levels of the government, FBI, NSA, they have a lot of information about people. If you use the internet, Facebook, Google, Amazon, iTunes, they have a lot of information about us. But the truth is, your local first responders, the actual people that are there to help you, EMS, fire department, police, they don't have instant access to that information unless you voluntarily disclose it. So I highly recommend, if you haven't already, to fill this out. Also, go to your town's website. A lot of towns now are updating it, so you can just input your information right on the town website. But if your uh, town doesn't have that, this form exists through all 351. Also, I speak at a lot of support groups for parents with uh, children with disabilities. One mother told me that her uh, two little ones, on top of some chronic medical conditions, are both autistic. And so she filled out this form, and whenever she needs to call 911, the ambulance and police know to shut off their lights and sirens as they approach her house because the noise is so overly stimulating for her kids. So that's just another example of they would not have known that information unless it was voluntarily disclosed. So along with 911, because 911 doesn't really work the same way we think it works, when you call 911, it does not go directly to your local police. It goes to a regional hub. As of maybe a few years ago, there used to be a joke where right now I could call us Domino's 
and Domino's knows exactly where I'm standing because of the technology on my phone. But as of a few years ago, if you called 911 on your cell phone in Massachusetts, they might not have been able to find where you are. Now, luckily, we have some money. We've updated our system so that if you call 911 on a cell phone in Massachusetts, they can find you. We do a cool thing called triangulation. Three cell phone towers make a little triangle, and they can figure out where we are in the middle of the triangle. However, not every state has updated. And what that means is that if you're traveling across the country and you need help and you call 911 on your cell phone, it is possible that the dispatcher says to you, where are you? What are some highway exits? So that is just something good to keep in mind. Who here still has a landline? Okay, so you are good. You are like rooted into the system. So definitely hold on to your landline. But as I said before, in Massachusetts, our cell phones will also work. On the previous page to this, I believe we are the first state in the country to offer texting to 911. Quick show of hands, who here texts? Okay. The reason I like to highlight this, even if you think you'll never need to text, is you probably know teenagers, young ones in their 20s. So if you can imagine you're a teenager, you're at a high school party, and you feel very unsafe, you want to call for help, but you don't want the people around you to know you're calling, you can text to 911. Or if it's late at night, you're in the back of an Uber or Lyft or a taxi, you feel very unsafe, you might not want to call because again, the driver will know you're calling, you can text to get help. And like what most of the things I'm sharing with you, you are probably some of the only people in your community that knows that, that exists. So please share that with any nieces, nephews, children, grandparents, kids in the neighborhood, because it could save somebody's life in a first aid scenario. Along with that, so we call 911 when we need help. When your government wants to call you, they use reverse 911. So what that looks like, I like to make the noise, I'm not sure if how it will come across on the camera. Have you ever heard an Amber Alert? Yeah. Ah, ah. So that is an example, not, exa not the same system, but an example of your government using reverse 911. If you have a landline, you should get a call. If you're listening um, on the radio, they'll interrupt the broadcast, television, we're trying to update it for all cell phones, emails, things like that. But along with that blanket system, there are two big, big things that you can do to get information in the moment. And these are probably the two most important things I'm gonna share with you. The first is on the next page, page seven. Who here has a smartphone? So a smartphone is any phone that's capable of going on the internet. What your state has provided for you, and what I mean by that is using your tax dollars, we've bought this. It's called Ping for Inc. It has a very odd name, I apologize. But if you type in wherever you get applications, and I'm happy to share with you all where on your phones to find that, what this does, and again, it's free for you, is it uses the GPS on your phone to know if you're safe. So for example, I was giving a training in Yarmouth maybe three or four months ago. And while I was giving the training, I got a little alert on my phone. I quickly looked, and it said, there is a tornado six miles away. Now, my phone knew that. It knew where I was in proximity to the event because I had this little app. And it uses GPS, Global Positioning Satellite, and it will only bother you if you're in that disaster radius. So if I was down here, and something, let's say, happens in Worcester, well, my phone's not going to bother me because my phone knows that I'm safe. So take the three and a half seconds it might take to download, keep it on your phone, tell everyone you know with a smartphone to download it, and if it's in Massachusetts, you'll get that alert. And that's just a quick thing for me to highlight. Because if you're down in Florida, same thing happens, there's a tornado right next to me, I'm not gonna get the alert. Because our system is decentralized, meaning each state right now does its own thing. So if you're in Massachusetts, this, this alert will cover you. So that's the second most important thing. The most important thing I'm gonna share is on page 14, and it's called 211. Quick show of hands. Who here has ever seen or heard of 211? Okay, very few people have. So I was living in Boston during the Boston Marathon bombing, and that was on a Monday, 2013. On that Thursday night, the city of Boston issued out a shelter in place. And now I'm gonna define that term because there's hypothetically 500 different disasters you could face. Hurricane, tornado, chemical spill, terrorist attack. But 
regardless of what the event is, in all reality, your government will only tell you to do one of two different things. We're either going to tell you to evacuate, to get out of a certain area or head to a certain shelter, or we're going to tell you to shelter in place, which is the opposite. It's a fancy way of saying, do not go outside, stay exactly where you are. So that's what Boston did on that Thursday, because they were chasing the two terrorists throughout the city. They issued a shelter in place, no one go outside. When I woke up the next morning, I had no idea if the shelter in place was still in effect. It turns out it was. I could have called the local police, I guess, but I'm sure they were very busy. 211 is the phone number you call to get information. So it is staffed by MEMA, the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency, and they are there to answer all of these questions like, what is going on? How do I evacuate? Where is my local shelter? So if you remember nothing else from this training, remember the phone number 211. Because what will happen is if there ever, hopefully not, there's ever an event in this area and we all get that alert to evacuate, everyone will panic and everyone calls 911. When you have a large amount of people all calling the same number at the same time, it jams and it stops working. You are now some of the only people in this area that know of this other number which exists to help with the information. So similar to what I've been discussing, make sure you share 211 and they will know about state level incidents. So just to highlight that. All disasters start at the local, local level. So if there is a fire at that house right next door, one of us will call 911, they'll dispatch that to your local fire department, police department. They'll send their fire trucks. If this fire continues to spread, then all of the cities and towns around your neighborhood, they'll get a phone call, they'll send their fire trucks. If that fire continues to spread, does anyone know who now gets a phone call? <laughs> so the state, MEMA, the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency. Now they start directing people. If that fire continues to spread, does anyone know who next gets a phone call? <laughs> FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And now they start directing resources. So this is my way of saying if you, let's say, see a fire next door and you call 211, it's very possible that the dispatcher will say, I'm very sorry, sir or ma'am, but we have not been made aware of this incident because it's just a small, small local level. In which case, don't call 911 unless you need help. Call directly your local fire department or police department if you need information. But if you're reporting the fire, definitely call 911. That is, again, the phone number for help, 211 for information. So that was a very long segment just on communication. As I quickly try to find my coffee behind me, does anyone have any questions about anything I've discussed so far? Was this scenario tested two years ago when there was the, these gas explosions in Lawrence and North Andover? Oh, so I'm going to bring up the Merrimack uh, Valley gas leaks in a little bit. When you say the system was tested, can you clarify for me what you mean? Um, 211? Yeah, 211 and, and, and notifying people in the area to either leave or whatever. So that's a great question because as we kind of demonstrated, you, the majority of you just found out this existed. I don't actually know how many people called 211 because it is a program that very few people know. I would like to say and imagine that maybe the few members of that community did know that number and called and it worked great. But unfortunately, I actually haven't met anyone who said, oh, I used that number before. Because again, it's a phone number that very few people know. But that is exactly the type of scenario that knowing 211 will help you with because then they'll be able to tell you, yes, you need to evacuate your home, get out of this area. Great question. So that was communication. Now we're going to talk about sheltering. Has anyone here ever had to stay in a shelter? OK. We're all very lucky. That's good. So there are two big takeaways from shelters, and they both do come from Hurricane Katrina. So during Hurricane Katrina, they opened up a large amount of different types of shelters. And they would tell people, OK, if you have uh, a medical disability, we want you over here. Senior citizens, you're down here. If you meet X, Y, Z criteria, you go over here. What this was doing was, one, it was causing a lot of confusion. People just didn't know where to go. But two, it was splitting apart families and friends. And that's the last thing we want to do during emergencies. We want you all to stay together because you're each other's natural support structure. So what that means is we want everyone to head to the general population shelter. And what that also means is that it's our responsibility to make sure that we're meeting your needs. So make sure you disclose things to the volunteers, if you have medical conditions, if you have allergies, if you have ailments. It is our responsibility as the state 
to make any accommodation, especially where it comes to people with disabilities. So for example, if somebody has a wheelchair, mobility issues, we have special cots that you can get adjusted at certain levels, put against the wall. If you use life-saving equipment, medical equipment, make sure you disclose that. We'll make sure you buy the generators. Medication, we want you to keep it on you, but if it needs to be refrigerated at certain temperatures, we'll have the, um, those methods available. So make sure you're disclosing to the volunteers what you need. Everyone goes to the general population shelter. Second big takeaway, who here has a pet? Okay, so during Hurricane Katrina, people were told you cannot bring your pets to the shelter, leave your dogs and cats at home. And this put people in a very uncomfortable situation because for a lot of us, our pets are our family. So what unfortunately happened was people stayed home with their dogs and cats, did not evacuate, and unfortunately died because they didn't head to the shelter. So learning that lesson, you can bring your pets to the shelter. That is not a barrier to, of entry. Try to bring a crate, bring their tags, certifications, medicine, food, all that good stuff, but that is not a barrier. I cannot promise you, you'll get to stay with your pets. In a lot of circumstances, they open up literally a pet shelter where they'll keep all the pets nice and safe. But again, that's not a barrier of entry. Who here has a horse or a cow? Okay. You laugh, but sometimes I've been in like rooms like this and half the people raise their hands. For some reason, everyone in that town likes to have a horse. Just so you know, you would not bring your horse to the shelter, but as part of your local emergency plan, they will have a plan for large animals and then your local emergency manager will say, okay, bring the horse down there, we'll make sure they're nice and safe, and now you come to the shelter. That's so these, That's very cool. There you go. No one will leave their dog. Would you leave your dog or your cat or any other dog? Yes. You leave it. So you can bring your pets to the shelter. So those are the two big takeaways. Head to the general population shelter, and you can bring your pets. That is not a barrier of entry. Any questions on shelters? Okay. This is normally the time of the training where someone gets angry at me, and they say, well, I have a pet allergy. So how come the pet gets to be there and I can't? <laughs> Fortunately, you're all very nice, I didn't get yelled at. So what I will say, it's not me making a moral argument, just a legal argument, is the pet has a right to be there. So if you do have allergies though, one, now that you know to expect that there could be pets, pack some um, allergy medication, throw it right in the red bag, that way you'll be good to go. And then also disclose to the volunteers, oh, I have an allergy, and then they can try to maybe move you to a different area or set up a um, like little barrier around the pets. And of course, um, service animals are also allowed. So if a service animal, that's considered an extension of the person, meaning if you have a service animal, you will be able to keep that service animal with you. There's a lot of confusion around service animals, so just very, very quickly. There is no special class or certification a service animal has to take. There is no special vest that proves this is or is not a service animal. If I'm a volunteer and someone brings to me their pet, and they say this is a service animal, I can only ask them two questions. One, is this a service animal? Or two, what service does this animal provide for you? I can't say prove it. I can't say make it do a trick. So that's just for your own edification and all the rights with service animals. So that was shelter. Before we go to your individual preparedness now, there's two big things in this packet I wanna highlight. The first is on page 15. So you have an incredible council of on aging here. But if you are ever looking for personal care services, day services, health and therapeutic, equipment, mental health, in-home support, anything like that, Mass Options is here to help connect you with those programs. So if you are looking for programs and services, my first stop would be the Council of Aging here because I bet they know very well what the local services and programs. However, yes, please. So depending on really the size of your community, that seems to um, be the difference between really the size of the staff. So I can't say that in all 351 cities and towns, they all have the same amount of staff and that staff is equally qualified to connect you. I'm, but if I was you, my first step would be the outreach coordinator here. Second step, if that doesn't work, is to call Mass Options, go on this website play around with it for 20, 30 minutes, and you'll be surprised what services do exist that they can help connect you to. 
and also on the following page, re-equipment. So if you have old medical equipment, wheelchair, rocker, uh, cane, shower chair, anything like that just sitting in a basement, you can call these people up. They'll come by, pick it up, make it all nice and new, give it to somebody in need. Vice versa, if you need equipment, and again, you just don't know where to go, don't think you can afford it, first stop, ask the lovely people who work here. Second stop, call re-equipment, and you'd be amazed at how much stuff is kind of just laying around and they just don't know who, who needs it. So mass options for programs and services, re-equipment for equipment. But now we can go to your individual preparedness. So regardless, as I mentioned before, there's hypothetically 500 different scenarios you could face, but you're going to need two different things. You're going to need materials, which I'm gonna to get to right at the end, and you're also going to need information. You can have the sharpest memory in the world, but if you get that alert to evacuate, you will panic, and there's no way you'll be able to recall the phone number of your third emergency contact. That's just not how our minds work. You'll get hit with adrenaline, you're going to fight or flight. So we have to have everything written down, especially because if you just have it on a computer and the power goes out, that's no longer good enough. So everything needs to be written down, ready to go at a moment's notice. I refer to this packet as like the mother packet. It would probably take you 20 minutes to fill out, but the 20 minutes that you fill out in this packet could save your life and pay huge dividends three or four years from now, if in case you ever do face an, an emergency. So for example, we brought up the Merrimack Valley gas leaks. What ended up happening th during that event is people were told houses are exploding, you have to evacuate, and some people were not allowed back into their homes for three or four months. So every one of you has a desk drawer, a filing cabinet that has your bank account information, your insurance information, your state issue IDs, all that good stuff. You might only need it once every three months. But if you ever have a large scale disaster like that and you're told that you cannot physically go inside of your home, it would be a huge derailment to your life if you don't have all of that information written down in another location. And that's really what this packet is designed to do. So I don't need to go through it line through line. The first page though is your biographical information, your name, your address, all that good stuff. Pages two, three, and four are your emergency contacts. We want you all to have three emergency contacts, two that live close to you, and one that lives in a different state or far away. And the reason for that is if Norwood gets hit with a large scale disaster, we all get the alert to evacuate. It's gonna be very hard for me to help you or for you to help me. But if we have somebody who lives far away, we can call that person up and say, hey, turn on the news, something crazy is going on right now. I'm gonna pack, can you try to figure out where my shelter is? And now you have somebody safe who can help you. The next page is your medication. So I don't know about you, I take a lot of medication. I'm very calm right now. I can't spell or pronounce any of the stuff that I take. I don't know how many milligrams any of that stuff is. So that's my way of saying you have to have it all written down in case you forget to grab it and now you have to coordinate with a pharmacy or a local volunteer. The same with our medical ailments. A lot of us use slang to describe our conditions, but if you end up having to, again, speak to a 19-year-old volunteer who doesn't really know all the lingo, having your full medical conditions written down, same with your allergies, making sure that's all written down. The next few pages are about your insurance information. If you use life-saving equipment, oxygen tanks, that type of things, make sure you have it all, like the VIN numbers written down, what specifically do you need. That way, if you forget it or if it's damaged during an event, you might be able to recuperate your losses. The final two pages are about your own kind of evacuation plan. You should have a good idea of what is the fastest way out of my apartment or home. So if you don't, have in your mind a little mental path of, oh, the stairwell was right there, go down the stairs, enter that door. But it's very hard for me to tell you what the evacu evacuation route out of Norwood or Westwood would be, because again, I don't know what the event will look like. So if you want to just, for another time, write down 211 in big numbers, so you remember to call that for information, you'll be all set. So even though I trust, yes, please. Uh, there's only one sheet for personal information. Should each person in your house have one of these? So that's a great question. If you can, I would say put it on one thing. If you have the means to, each person can have their own packet. It really depends on the size of your family.
But, but that's a great question. And even though I'm sure you're all going to go home after this, you're going to fill this out. In all reality, what will happen next, you will fill this out and then you will throw it on a kitchen table or a desk drawer and you'll completely forget that you did it. That's okay, that's just what people do. So we want you to write down this information in three different locations. This is the first one. This is your mother packet. It has all that good information. The second location, and this was mentioned before we started rolling today, is something called the file of life. And I think the person stole my file of life, but I'm gonna just use my hands so you all know what it looks like. So the file of life, it has what is really just a condensed version of what we just discussed. The two most important things it has is your medication and your allergy. So if you're at your residence, you fall, hit your head, very good. Uh, somebody finds you, they call 911, 911 comes to your door. There's no way your local fire department will be able to find this packet. Because again, you've hit it and you're the only one on the planet that knows where it is. But all local EMS are trained to look on your refrigerator for that little red file of life. They take it and now they know your medication, they know your allergies, so they won't give you anything that complicates it. Now, in the past, and I do need to say this now, do not put it in your freezer. Put it on the outside of your freezer. The reason I'm saying that is in the past, that's what they used to do. And so somebody like me 30 years ago would be saying, you put it in your freezer. Some genius then thought, why don't we just put a magnet on the back, put it on the outside of the freezer. That guy probably saves 20,000 lives a year. So make it, it should be on the outside of the refrigerator. If it's not, if you do not have that, you have an older one, they have a few hundred of them here, please grab it. If you do have it already, think to yourself, when was the last time I checked that my medication and allergies reflected what I actually take? So make sure you do update it. And we have plenty of file of life, both for the refrigerator and for your wallet. Yes. So if you need any, come see me. We have plenty of them. Thank you, sorry. Perfect, no, no, please. So that's the second location. We have the mother packet, we have our file of life. The third is the shiny blue packet. So I mentioned in the beginning that I always get a kick when I pass this out because the first thing everyone does is they start to spin it and then I hear people whisper, oh, we made a mistake, Brenton. <laughs> the reason it looks like this is somewhere along the way my supervisor figured out that if I print it like this and I just show you how to fold it, it saves us like $20,000. You don't need to do this, but just for the people watching at home and my little origami, if you face it so the disaster kit is facing you, Grab it at the top and the uh, bottom, fold it back, make a little crease, take it in the middle, pinch it down, make a little crease. Now it looks like it makes sense. This is also the part of the training where two or three people will stop listening to me and they'll just keep trying to fold this. <laughs> this cannot save you in a uh, large-scale disaster. I am happy to fold each and every one of these for you afterwards, so please don't let this distract you. And all this is is a miniature version of everything I've already discussed. We have how to contact the Massachusetts Office on Disability, on the back, what does it mean to shelter in place, the top, or what type of materials could you use, but I'm going to get to that uh, in a few minutes. The inside is that third and final time that I want you to fill out your information. Then fill it out, fold it any way you want, Put it in a Ziploc bag so it's waterproof. And then I tell people, just put it right in the red bag. So that way, if you panic, if you forget nothing else, and all you do is grab the red bag, you'll have your information in there as well. The last thing that I want to highlight, because it looks a little out of place, it says active shooter slash terrorism. So the reason that is on this is I mentioned at the beginning that while I work for the Massachusetts Office on Disability, this program is provided from the federal government, from the Department of Homeland Security. If you ever work for a federal agency, they can say, okay, you can take our money, but we want you to talk about um, a few items. And this is one of those big items. So active shooter slash terrorism is whenever you hear gunfire and you think there might be someone going around shooting people. Unfortunately, it happens all too often. It does follow the steps of a natural disaster. So the first thing they tell you to do is evacuate, or in this case, run. Now it's very possible that you might need to skip that step, either because one, you can't run for mobility issues, but also, if you ever heard gunfire in real life, it's very difficult to know if what you just heard was gunfire. It doesn't sound the same way it does on television. Also, 
Oh, I'm sorry, just for a second I got distracted by the camera. <laughs> also, gunfire echoes. It bounces off every brick building and wall, meaning it's also very difficult to know the direction that gunfire is coming from. So unless you are 100% sure and capable, and you know that going this way is safe, you might have to do step number two. And step number two is to shelter in place. If you're outside, you go as low as you can, try to get behind something. If you're indoors, do not go outside, unless again, you think the gunfire is coming from there. You would shelter in place in the room, shut and lock all the doors. If you can, put a barricade in front of it. Turn your phone to silent, stay out of uh, look of the windows. Third step is to fight. The reason that's a step is if you can imagine I'm speaking in front of a high school or college audience, someone might think, oh, if I hear gunfire, I want to run towards the gunfire to stop the person. I, as a representative of the state, do not want you to do that because you'd be putting yourself in harm's way. So you only fight as a last resort. And then fourth and finally is to listen to the first responders. Keep your hands visible at all times. Move nice and slow. Do what they tell you to do. I'm happy to answer any questions on it if you do. But to help cheer you up, I can now show you the nice goodies I get to leave you with. So in the disaster world, there's something called the rule of four. Every four minutes, you need to breathe. Every four hours, you need shelter, whether that's clothing or protection from the environment. Every four days, you need water. And every four weeks, you need food. That's not 100% true. Depending on your age, body type, or environment, I could probably make it six days without water. But no one wants to go through that. The purpose of these bags are not for you to imagine you're on a desert island by yourself fighting to survive. The purpose of these bags are really for two big scenarios. One is similar as what we discussed, the California wildfires. So this was, I think, maybe a year or two ago. But when they first got that really big fire, someone was in their uh, car. They got the alert. They sent out a little tweet on their phone saying, I just got the alert to evacuate. I panicked. All I did was grab my Tom Brady jersey, <laughs> which Tom Brady thought was funny. That's how I liked it. But then about another 24 hours later, uh, that same person said, I've been stuck in traffic for 24 hours without food or water. I really wish I was better prepared. So that is one of those scenarios you might need this for. If we have a large scale event where everyone in your city and town and surrounding cities and towns are all heading to the highway, you might be in traffic for a very long time. Everyone in this room could make it 24 hours without water, but no one wants to go through that. We want you to be nourished and alert so that you can make it through. The second type of event is if we, let's say, a shelter in place. So in Boston in 2015, we had these big snowstorms where it was back to back to back to back weekends. You just couldn't physically go outside. So people, do you have enough food or water for two or three days? And three days is the standard. The biggest item that you all have to leave here and go buy is food. So we used to put six cans in here. But what ended up happening was after the training, people would say, thank you very much. They would grab the bag and try to go. And it was so physically heavy that people couldn't lift it. We want you to take the bags. So buy canned goods or dry goods. Keep them at your residence. You'll have them for a shelter in place. Buy some items, put them in the bag. So that way, again, you'll stay nourished and alert. But we do give you plenty of water. So each bag has two large packets of emergency water. This is not normal water, and what I mean by that is it's highly condensed, purified with a lot of ele electrolytes. Two of these individual bags per day per person, which means we've given you enough water, so two or three people will be good for two or three days. Also, these have a very long shelf life. The bottles of water that we all drink last roughly nine months to a year, and then they become unsafe to drink. They might be able to um, have bacteria. These bags are good for five years which means you are all good from now until 2025, in which case, take it. If you want to give it a little sip to see what it would taste like, have fun, but then throw it away and buy bottles of water and recycle every year. Where do we get new ones in five years? Great question. So everything in these items you can buy separately, individually. We, because it's the state is issuing them, you can't go online and buy this literal red bag, but you can buy all the separate items or similar items. So I would go to any like outdoor store, um, Army, Navy stores, anything like that locally. If you go online and just type in emergency water, you'll find, if not exactly this, something identical. Great question, though. We also, um, 
this it's probably more expensive than the bottles of water so if you really wanted to bottle water every year recycle it it's kind of just up to you we also give you multiple packets of tissues one this will be heavily traumatic events people will be crying but second if you're stuck in your car in traffic for 24 hours you have to pull over and use the restroom mm -hmm. we have you taken care of uh, you might you might just have to uh, just move to the side we also give you um, two emergency blankets so if you ever watched a marathon when they cross the finish line it looks like they're wrapping them in tin foil it's not actually tin foil it's this material what this does is it maintains or increases your body temperature. I was asked this once at a training, so I always like to bring it up if I can find my coffee. But if I had my nice coffee, oh, thank you. If I had my nice coffee thermos, putting cold water in it, it stays cold. Putting warm water in it, it stays warm. That's not how this material works. This material can only be used to maintain or increase your body temperature. So that is my way of saying, if it is warm outside, if you go through an event in the middle of summer, do not wrap yourself in this because you can overheat your body and it might cause more problems than it solves. We also give you two ponchos. Most of us are familiar with the poncho. It just keeps the water off you so you're nice and dry. If there is a fun event a few months from now and you think to yourself, oh, I should bring the poncho, you're all going to now remember that you have free ponchos in the bag. There is no one in this room, myself included, that could take this out of this bag and then refold it and put it back in the bag. So that is my way of saying these are all single use items. You can take it, have fun, live your life, but you have to remember to buy another one and put it back in the bag. We also give you hand warmers. They say 10 hours. Most of us have used hand warmers before. We know they're good for two or three, but it'll at least keep you nice and warm. We also give you a first aid kit. So similarly, if you give yourself a cut in about an hour or two, you're gonna remember you have Band-Aids, use it, but make sure you restock it. And please uh, address any like minor scrapes you get, because if you stay in a shelter, diseases spread rapidly. You'll be around a lot of people you don't know who aren't keeping up with their hygiene in the same way. So do treat any minor scrapes. We also give you two feminine hygiene pads. So they have their initial use, but also, if you look at these band-aids, this is actually the best bandage that you have in the bag. So if you're ever with someone or you yourself get a very large cut, the number one rule is pressure. Take uh, the pads out, put them together, and just add pressure, and you could actually save your life with someone around you. Um, along that vein, if there is a shelter in place for a few days, one of the most common injuries will be people will slice their hands when they try to open the cans that they bought three or four years ago. So we bought you all a can opener. <laughs> it has a little spinny thing. You put your hand right there and you do this. You'll keep yourself nice and safe. And actually, I'm excited because these are the new bags that we ordered. So they have some new trinkets that you're the first ones who get to get. So we have the 14-in-1 pocket tool. So it, it has all the little gadgets and gizmos that you could use. Again, keep them with you. It's a great product. We also got for you the five-gallon um, plastic jugs. So this unfolds. So let's say if there is an event that's going on, you can now fill this with five gallons worth of even more water so that you can use either for your own hygiene or for drinking. Along the uh, theme of hygiene, if you're told to evacuate, most people forget to grab soap and shampoo and all that good stuff. So we got you all those products. So that way, again, you can keep up with your hygiene. Um, it has soap, How shampoo. How much is the battery? That's a great question. Uh, I'm going to say seven and a half pounds. Well, it's not that bad, even though they don't that in there. That's true. <laughs> wow. okay. uh, so it has all the different products you would need. It has a comb if you're lucky enough to still have your hair. There's a little uh, red bio bag. If you're ever in a small environment, you can throw like your waste in that red bag, again, to keep yourself nice and safe. We give you some tools for communication. So a whistle, in case you're trapped by yourself, you need to make some noise. We give you a little glow up low, uh, glow stick. Just take it out of the bag. It's a little tube of plastic, like when you were a kid. Bend it in half, the chemicals combine. It's visible up to a mile. Your car breaks down the middle of the night. You can wave it around. The last product we give you, the one that has the best value, is the four-in-one flashlight radios. So we used to give the flashlight radios that had those big, big Duracell batteries. 
But what ended up happening was three years from now when you needed it, the batteries were dead. So this doesn't use batteries. What it uses is a little hand crank. One minute of doing this gives you 10 minutes of power. So you have a flashlight, you have a radio, so you can get information, you have a little noise maker. But the coolest thing this can do is it can charge your cell phones. So if you just take your cell phone cord, they all use a little USB port now. You just plug that in here. Hopefully you'll be able to get a charge. Now, if you have a smartphone, you have a little bit of an advantage because this has that cool app I talked about earlier. It has all the gadgets and gizmos, but this is really a mini computer and it requires a lot of power to generate. So I've been able to do it. I killed my phone before, plugged it in here, charged it up. That's my way of saying, just hand this to the healthiest person you're with and tell them to go nuts. But did anyone here keep the old school phones, the ones that don't go on the internet or the old school flip phones? Mm -hmm. So those are actually very, very easy to charge. And anyone in here could plug that in and just nice and slow do this and you'll get enough of a charge to call police or get for help. So along with everything here, there are two big things you have to add. One I mentioned earlier is food. The second is your information. Make sure you have copies of your state issue IDs, your insurance information, bank account, anything that again, if you face like what happened in Merrimack Valley, you can just keep living your life without being too much of an obstacle. Before I leave you here today, I have two big asks of you. The first is to actually fill out your information. The best case scenario is that you all go home, you throw this somewhere, and you never use it for the rest of your life. That's the best case scenario. You got some free food, we all got to hang out for an hour, it's not the worst way to spend some time. But in all reality, there are two things I can promise you. One is that Massachusetts has the oldest infrastructure in the United States, which means events like the Merrimack Valley gas leak could theoretically happen with more probability. Second, there's more moisture in the air. When there's more moisture in the air, two different things occur. One, we have more storms. Two, the storms we do have are greater in intensity. So it's my hope that we don't need to use any of this information, but please do make sure you fill this out. The second ask I have for you is actually for me personally. So I have a really fun job where I spend the majority of my time traveling across Massachusetts. I get to meet nice people like yourselves. I try to steal a sandwich on my way out and then I just get to go home. That's my way of saying that my boss doesn't actually know if I'm physically in this room right now. I could theoretically be on my couch watching television and then I could just send an email saying, oh, the training went great and no one would be able to catch me. Now today is actually special because we have a new member of the Massachusetts Office on Disability here, so I wouldn't be able to get away with my usual thing. Thank you, Patricia, for coming. <laughs> but what we do instead to make sure that I'm accountable is that we have a little evaluation. So I'm gonna just pass this out in a second. And all you have to do is really just check the boxes. You do not need to fill out anything at the top. I get a big kick out of reading the comments so please, if you would like, please feel free to leave me a comment. Oh, thank you. And all I really need you to do is check the boxes. Agree means you thought you did a great job. Partly agree means you thought I was meh. Disagree means you thought I was horrible. I'm going to give you all the bags regardless, so you don't have to lie. Please tell the truth. Also along the pens, um, every training I do, people like to steal my pens. If you could, please give them back, but it's not the worst thing in the world. I'm happy to answer your questions while I'm passing these evaluations out. But thank you all for having me here. You've been a great audience. Thank you very much. Thank you.